also explain because your program says there's meant to be a panel um, with two people. Uh, the other participant, Roya, couldn't get a visa. These things happen. Um, so we're going to have a talk instead. Uh, one of the things that Natalie's going to talk about is, we kind of touched upon this in the previous session as well. It's about how much people understand the tools that they're engaging with. Um, and as Alondra mentioned, a lot of our conversation tends to be around middle class, educated, white collar people in the West. Um, what we, and, and, and for those of you who were here yesterday, you might remember that we, when we talk about people in the poor world, we talk about farmers and grain prices. Uh, when actually people want to get online, they want to get on Facebook and WhatsApp. Um, and so the, what I wanted to say to just set, uh, set the scene, is so that a few years ago I wrote a piece, and it's very self-indulgent, forgive me, but a few years ago I, I wrote a piece um, using both survey and anecdotal data uh, showing that there were millions of users across the poor world who had no idea that Facebook was the internet. Um, because you, you take out your phone, there's an app there, one takes you to the internet, which is your browser, and the other one takes you to Facebook. Um, and kind of the point of that piece was to explain that it's very easy to be patronizing or condescending towards these attitudes, but these attitudes exist. They're not simply a matter of education, they're a matter of the way businesses and technology frame their devices and the way people are forced to engage with them. Um, and so um, Natalie's going to talk a little bit about that and then move on um, to education in the UK. Natalie. Hi. So, um, yes, Natalie Richards, CEO and co-founder of Educate. And I thought a good place to start would actually be to tell you a little bit about what it is that we do at our company and my journey in, in starting the company. And then also kind of looking at some of my thoughts on the inclusion problem that we have in tech. But as I said, um, or rather as Leo was saying, um, mine is going to be far more optimistic uh, presentation. I'm sure you'll be very relieved to hear. Um, I think that uh, tech has so much um, opportunity to be able to transform outcomes for those in our communities who are most in need. So um, I come from a consulting background. Um, I've worked a lot as a project manager within an IT context and um, wanted to strike out on my own and, and found um, an online and internet um, focused company. Uh, but in doing so, wanted to do something that I was passionate about and I've always been incredibly passionate about helping young people to achieve their potential. So I thought that was a good place to start. Um, we're an ed tech or a social tech company. Uh, by doing the work that we do with our schools, we're enabling students to um, achieve their potential. Uh, and essentially, we're all about giving tools to schools, to educators, that help to transform outcomes for students. And that's particularly around uh, student well-being and understanding the pastoral side of education. Because all too often, we focus on academic attainment and in practice, if a student is suffering from so low self-esteem um, or they have issues at home or they're being bullied, whether that's online or in the real world, uh, they just can't attain. So um, Educate provides schools with the tools to be able to better understand the needs of their students and how to respond to those. And we also have a directory, a kind of a trip advisor style directory of support that schools can use both inside and outside of the classroom in order to support students um, in doing better. Um, and I also sit on the uh, board of Virgin Unite, um, which is the um, charity or the foundation of the Virgin brand and the Branson family. And that's where I came to meet Roya, um, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, which is a huge shame because she's doing some amazing work in Afghanistan and the Middle East on um, providing uh, a voice to women um, online and enabling women to be part of the digital economy. Um, so, where did I want to start? I wanted to start in terms of this, this, this phrase around tech having an inclusion problem and, and just give a few thoughts about what that, that conjured up for me. Um, and I thought when, when we start to talk about inclusion, uh, what we're often talking about is who's not included, right? Um, whose voices aren't being heard. Um, and if we look at two broad groups, so the developed world and the developing world, if we start with the developed world, um, when, when we do work in our schools, often we find that, um, unsurprisingly, it's the young people, it's the students who are most disadvantaged, who have less access, meaningful access, um, to the internet and to digital tools. And that's, that's unsurprising, right? So um, it's about helping those communities to better understand the opportunities that exist and be able to use the internet um, more effectively. And I'll talk a little bit later about um, how 
vulnerable some of those uh, people can be um, using those tools. Um, but then also they're the older populations, right? The, um, the silver surfers. Um, we have a huge problem, certainly in the UK, when it comes to social isolation of older people. And digital technology can try to tackle that. I think there's a long way to go um, in order to be able to fully utilize the, um, the potential and the benefits um, of the internet and the online space. Uh, but certainly that is an application in, in that domain. Um, I think one thing that's often often overlooked um, are prison populations, right? Uh, when we talk about um, the developed world and, and having, I think it's in, um, in North America, there's over 90% uh, digital access or digital literacy. Uh, in Europe, it's over 80%. Um, but it's astounding that most prison populations don't actually have any meaningful access to the internet. Um, and that's whether, that's not just the entertainment side of the internet, it's also the, uh, the knowledge side, it's the educational opportunities. Uh, I personally think a lot of work needs to be done there because what we're doing is having people who are rejoining communities um, who had this huge disconnect for 5, 10, 20 more years um, and, and, and therefore not able to make sophisticated use um, of digital tools. So I think that's something within the developed world that, that I see that, that does concern me. But with, the, with regards to the developing world, I can certainly be far, far more optimistic. Um, we are only scratching the surface in terms of the potential. Um, I spent some time in um, Uganda a few, a few years back, and it was so inspiring to see um, there was a program out there that was working with local women to get women online and developing their own online businesses. Um, and it, it clearly has such a, such a huge potential in that regard. And I think that some of the time when we do talk about the negative side of the internet, we're forgetting that there are these huge communities um, in other countries where it's just literally so transformational um, and that presents such an exciting, uh, an exciting opportunity. Um, I think another um, element of this, this conversation is around um, what meaningful access to the internet means. Um, and here I'll, I'll look at some of the work that we've been doing specifically uh, with schools that we support. Um, and we do see incidents of, of you know, the internet and online tools and tech being used um, in a way that is harmful to young people. Um, there are instances of cyberbullying um, and, and more and more examples of that. Um, and within cyberbullying, it's probably interesting to say that I think there's a huge part, and I'll talk a bit later about this as well, that regulators have to play in this space, right? Because it's a little bit sometimes like the wild, wild west. Sometimes it feels like anything goes. But I think that always happens when you get a new technology or a new way of doing things. Um, if we look at modern forms of transformation, this time 100 years ago, uh, when the car was starting to become the mode of transport that we were using, um, you know, there weren't speed limits, there weren't regulated ways, you know, there weren't restrictions on how much alcohol you could consume. You know, it kind of needed to evolve over time as our usage of, of cars and, and modern transformation evolved. So, um, I think that's a really, um, I think there is a role to play for regulators to really make, um, to really understand what the challenges are and to make sure that we have the right measures in place in order to protect our, our young people. Um, another aspect is grooming. Um, and in the UK context, online grooming again has had um, uh, a lot of focus, a lot of attention. It's something uh, that again, if we go back to the previous uh, conversation, AI and those types of tools can hopefully help um, uh, those in, in law enforcement to, to have a sense of where vulnerable young people are online and where there are opportunities to, uh, to be able to protect them because uh, that's obviously an area that our schools um, feel very, very concerned about. Um, so what does this mean for us at Educate? So um, clearly there are challenges, there are vulnerabilities around young people online, um, huge opportunities as well. So one of the things that we've spent a lot of time on in formulating the online tools that we provide to schools is to ensure that those tools can best respond to the evolving needs of, of students and learners. Um, so as an example, um, we do monitor how safe students feel online. Uh, we do monitor how, how students feel in terms of their peer relationships. Uh, we do monitor the way that, um, that students are using the internet and allow schools to be able to understand where their vulnerable learners are and therefore to be able to put the best support and measures um, in place to do that. 
Um, and also, from, from my perspective in, in building the business, um, the inclusiveness that I'm seeing in terms of the internet, particularly outside of the UK, certainly in the early days when you know, it was difficult to be able to afford to staff a big team, um, it was all about um, being able to tap into great resource internationally. And there's some great online tools where I could go and find people all around the globe um, who could come and contribute um, to areas of how we were trying to build our business. Um, so I, I think there's a Q&A portion to this presentation. So uh, just to round up with some, you know, some final thoughts or reflections, I think that the conversation around digital inclusion uh, really, for me, comes down to uh, three key points. So number one would be better access to, um, to the internet, to digital tools. Um, it's good to see, obviously, with the uh, penetration of the smartphone market, that in certain markets that we operate in, young people who don't have access to a computer can still engage meaningfully with, uh, with the online space. Um, it's about better education. I think there is a role for the school system to transform, given the huge potential that digital technology presents and, and the internet, so that young people are able to more meaningfully um, capitalize on that, on that potential. Um, and, and also, as I said, better regulation, uh, better ways of being able to monitor um, that usage um, and, and ensure that we are keeping the most vulnerable amongst us safe. Um, so um, I, think, I think I'll leave it there. I'd love to open um, for some, some questions and, and also to engage with Leo maybe a little bit around his thoughts of, about Facebook usage in, in other countries. I find that fascinating, but thank you. So, thank you, Natalie. Um, there will be, so, oh, there's someone with a mic. Um, if anyone has any questions. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, so you didn't touch on um, the role of, um, I guess, the sort of data surveillance and educational tech. It seems like a particular place where we haven't thought enough about how to protect children and students from like, the data grab that's happening in that space. So what would you offer about that problem? Um, about the, the need to be able to protect young people around educational tools? Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of those tools are offered for free or low cost because the, you know, the data is being gathered about children, yeah. data usage. I mean, I think it's all about transparency, personally. Um, I think, and it was interesting in the previous talk, there was this, uh, this comment about um, young Facebook users understanding what data was being collected and how that might be used and then maybe making different decisions, but then other people being more comfortable with that. So I think it really is a conversation about transparency. Some of that transparency is coming with um, the introduction of GDPR, for example, where people can ask to see the data that's being held on them, why that's being stored, where that's being stored, et cetera. I think we have further to go. Uh, but I would say, speaking to schools, they are more excited about the huge opportunities um, that, that, that this presents to them rather than being very fearful of, of the data. And you know, you might say that that's perhaps slightly naive, but I think that this increase in terms of transparency will, will, will help in that regard. I'm, I'm a big believer, Natalie, in good regulation, um, mm -hmm. helping with these things. So I, think, I think we run the risk today in 2018 of being a bit reactionary, um, whereas you know, good laws, good enforcement uh, can keep us from throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We don't want to not do these things because we're worried about them. We want to do them better. Are there any other questions? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of. Oh, Thanks. sorry. I'm oh, there you are. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I've been, you know, really considering the myth of a global product, how it can be difficult in ed tech to make a product that reaches different communities. And you, you mentioned um, various communities that could um, use better access, better education, better regulation. And I wonder, in, in your, from your perspective, do you see overlaps in the needs of these different communities? So do you mean, is, it, is, it, is there like a bespoke solution that's available that can be tailored to the different communities? Is that um, more your... Yeah, kind of. So um, not so much about a product that's available, but more so um, like what their particular uh, needs in terms of, I don't know, or maybe I should say instead of like... Um, gaps in their, in their knowledge or some areas that they're overlapping within the, the youth, the 
um, older users, and um, you had also mentioned like, women in the global south, for example. Mm -hmm. I just wonder um, if these are really each a very unique avenue, or if you see that there are things that um, that we can do in ed tech to um, to reach all of them all at once. Right, right, right. So. There are definitely commonalities, right? I mean, we definitely focus on youth, so under 25, so I can't talk too much to some of the evolutions in terms of adults. But if we look at the developed world and the developing world, now, I mean, we're working with over 500 schools globally, uh, the, predominantly in the UK, but expanding quite, quite quickly outside of the UK as well. And we are seeing a lot of crossover, right? Because um, the components to good, healthy well-being um, great self-esteem, resilience, aspirations for the future, good peer relationship. Those things exist in, in every geography, but it's the nature of, of the challenges that are faced that are slightly different. So I think there is, there is scope, certainly with the work that we're doing, to create a common framework around what we understand of well-being, as well as being able to make sure that the support is tailored to meet the needs um, of each of you know, the, the different geographies. Uh, what I would say is that this whole um, conversation around well-being, mental health, uh, pastoral care, safeguarding is a relatively new one in, in what we're hearing more recently. Uh, in the past, there has been a lot of complacency, right? We just want to improve academic performance or we want to get, you know, we want to get better grades for our school. And I think what we're realizing now, which I think is more than about time, is that you can't do those things if you haven't tackled the underlying challenges that young people are facing. And particularly in today's world where there's an increasing amount of pressure and, um, on, on the younger population, I think that's, that's an essential kind of conversation to have. And particularly with those young people who are most disadvantaged, they're far more likely to be held back by things that are experiencing outside of school than things that are happening in the classroom. So I think those are commonalities, again, that whether you're in the developed world or the developing world uh, are things that we can learn. As we, as we try to, you know, create the best educational opportunities online. Uh, but we have time for one last question before we break. I was just wondering with, so you've mentioned 500 schools globally, if they're private or state run or so I don't know yep. the, um, the financial model to, to educate. Yep. But um, the other part of the question was um, if there's any way to kind of, uh, change policy uh, so, so you know, try and influence governance in different countries. So, for example, uh, whether that's to encourage like uh, female participation or some schools, which is obviously yeah. with STEM or STEAM, they end up getting kind of yeah. <laughs> through whichever way, whether it's bias or racism across the the whole education system through to later on. But um, yeah. Okay. All right. So there was a bit, uh, a few points there. So first of all, in, in terms of how we're constituted. We're a company limited by shares, but we have a social mission that's kind of written into our constitutional document. So uh, we tackle, um, we help schools and others to tackle disadvantage amongst young people. So that's kind of how, uh, how we're set up. Um, to your second question, which was, are they uh, private or public schools? Predominantly, they are state-run schools or public schools. Uh, we are starting to do some work now with independent schools or, or fee-paying schools. Uh, but where we do, there is a cost involved, whereas if you are a, um, a public school, there's some, a lot of support that we will provide entirely for free as part of our social mission. Um, in terms of your, the second part of your question, which was around policy, yes. Yep. And I think there's huge, so we're already starting to work with some think tanks in this space. There's huge opportunity to be able to influence policy. Uh, by virtue of the type of uh, data that we collect when we work in schools, we, um, we pull data from the school's um, information management systems or the databases they use to monitor the attainment of their students, any challenges, behavioral or um, challenges, any, any very gifted students, you know, all of that is, is typically held in a, in a database. We access that database and we can then tie up the results of the wellbeing survey with the demographics of the students. So that allows us to have a data set that we do anonymize and aggregate um, and when we were talking about data and the potential um, challenges and concerns around data, because we are social tech, we always commit to using that data solely in order to improve outcomes for students. So in that regard, we have a huge and growing data set that we can work with policymakers to make sense of, okay, what are the relationships between um, 
attendance and how somebody feels about their home life. Um, or between propensity to go into a certain discipline and, and levels of aspiration. So to your question specifically about STEM or STEAM or, you know, <laughs> evolving different terminology, um, yes, there, there is potential to kind of do specific research within the data set and given our relationship with schools that can help to inform policy. And we see ourselves very much as having, having that role uh, because we can collate so many stories from different schools and insights from the data um, that we hold. Natalie, thank you. Well, welcome. And we'll be, <clears throat> we'll be back in half an hour for the next panel. So, we'll, we'll see you from lunch. <laughs> thank you.